Great. So, uh, welcome everybody to the first session from a new series we're organizing uh, called PMEP Leadership uh, Sessions. My name is Julia. I work as a product manager for Product Management Festival. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Product Management Festival is uh, doing uh, several things. We're organizing yearly two conferences, one in Zurich, one in Singapore. And um, we're publishing uh, reports on trends, trends and benchmarks with a lot of interesting data, which is always available for free downloading. And uh, together with INSAD, the business school, um, we are organizing uh, one week of uh, leadership training in product management. Um, for those of you aspiring to become product leaders or who are already in a position, feel like uh, you need to get control over that. Uh, and this um, series of session is dedicated to, especially to those people, of course, to everybody else as well, um, but especially to the people who are finding them in, finding themselves in the, um, a leadership position in product where they feel they need to um, learn more and uh, find ways to, to manage it. Uh, today, I have with me uh, Kamini Patel, who's uh, uh, our program coordinator, our uh, point of reference for this program. She will share a bit of information about it. Uh, and uh, as well, uh, Max Eskel, uh, who kindly agreed to um, do a presentation on, on a very interesting topic, I find. Um, and uh, thank you so much, both of you, for being here. Uh, Kamini, I will give the floor to you. Please um, tell us a bit about the PMEP and then we will uh, start next session. Okay, Kamini, if you can unmute yourself. Sorry. Hi, everyone. I'm Kamini Patel. Um, I am, well, I didn't realize actually, but I'm actually Max's warm up act. I'll just take a few minutes to tell you a little bit about the uh, INSEAD Product Management Executive Program. This program is a joint partnership between INSEAD Business School and the Product Management Festival that Yulia just uh, talked about. Uh, it was established about three years ago and has been successfully launched um, in, at the Fontainebleau campus and uh, we're expanding it to two other locations in, in the next few sessions. So who is the program for? The program is for current and rising product management executives. So exec executives who are already established or new executives who, who want to uh, uh, in, uh, increase their impact in their organization. And um, the pro program is so designed so it helps you to build upon what you've already uh, learned from your past experiences your current situation and as, uh, your future aspirations is so trying to integrate all those three aspects together. The program consists of a three pronged approach, product leadership sessions, leadership development, and then the personalized action plan. And I'll try and cover a summary of each, but obviously there's a lot more to tell than just, just what I'm presenting here today. So the leadership development sessions are led by Professor Noah Askin and his team from INSEAD Business School. And the leadership sessions consist of live examples, case studies, and there's a real help, um, focus on trying to help hone in on the topics that are important uh, in this day and age for product leadership and leadership development. So the leadership development is actually focused on your own personal leadership style, you, you, uh, how you acknowledge and develop your style, um, how do you acquire the right skills to lead diverse teams, leading without formal authority, because quite often product leaders uh, want to get stuff done but have no formal authority. Um, how do you uh, leverage your networks to get um, your goals established? And, and uh, also, how do you harness the power of uh, organizational culture, honing in on negotiation skills, uh, communicating with the board and then recognizing your own impact in a group dynamic. So that's the leadership development sessions. The product leadership sessions are focused on um, uh, focus more on product uh, leadership. So scaling your product organization, managing the board and stakeholders. Uh, how do you manage your portfolio effectively, building your product strategy to manage growth, 
using OKR, OKRs and KPIs effectively, and then guiding your organization through any change, be it mergers and acquisitions or um, the current uh, state with the COVID situation. The third prong is probably the most important uh, because this, this um, uh, uh, program helps you to uh, develop and uh, your own action plan, which is personalized and they're dedicated sessions that combine the lessons learned from the two di different areas and then you develop your own action plan. The product leadership sessions are led by product leaders from the industry, and here's the faculty advisors. Three or four of those will, will participate in the, in the product leadership session. Um, this is like a summary sample of the, a schedule uh, of a typical week that you spend at the uh, product management executive program. The light green sessions are the leadership development sessions and the dark green are uh, the product leadership sessions. So you can see there, you know, you have a lot of case studies, exercises, and a lot of reflection and action plan. So the, the two days, the dark green sessions are led by the product leaders that I was showing you on the previous slide. How does it benefit you? And it, it obviously, it's focused on how do you amplify your, your impact in a product management organization. So you acknowledge and develop your own leadership style. So as you can lead your organization through any growth or change, you recognize your impact in a group dynamic and guide you through any building your team, through any change to develop them and more importantly, to retain them. And then you learn advanced product management topics from key executives who have, uh, and from, you know, basically learn from the successes they've had and the mistakes they might, might have made. There's also focus on enhancing your soft skills and uh, communication and negotiation at the executive level, uh, especially with stakeholders. And then finally, the most important part is growing your network so you can learn from each other. And we have a very strong uh, alumni network uh, who are very integrated in, in not only within this focus, but also in, in uh, building uh, future executives. Here's a, a pick of a typical session. Um, at, I think this one's at Fontainebleau at campus and Professor Askin presenting. We are um, ready to um, have the next session in September. Uh, the INSEAD campuses are actually already, will be open for those sessions. And uh, in this COVID situation, we've already got a, a scheduled session, 21st to the 25th of September. The, these three campuses, as I mentioned earlier, the Fontainebleau campus in France, um, Singapore INSEAD campus, as well as the San Francisco campus. So we have product management executive programs happening this year at Fontainebleau and then in uh, Singapore and at the San Francisco hub in 2021. The net promoter score for this session was um, 89.9 uh, for, for the last session, in, in, uh, which was actually um, September 2019. And overall, the uh, promote, net promoter score for all the sessions is around 86.6. So that's a, a pretty high score, I think. And um, the program itself cost 9,200 euros or $10,200, depending on the location plus your expenses related to uh, travel and hotel. If you have any questions, here's a little summary of where the programs, uh, the forthcoming programs, but of course there'll be others that we'll be adding. So please don't hesitate to contact me directly uh, at exact at pmeeducation.com uh, or my phone number is on there. And if you want, you can even send me some uh, questions on chat and I'll be able to reply to you directly. Um, just to sum up, this program also qualifies towards the INSEAD Certificate in Global Management. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kamini, for the nice introduction. Um, now to um, our main um, guest for tonight, uh, this evening, uh, for us evening, for maybe others, uh, other times of the day. Um, Max uh, is actually an alumni of this program. Um, he has a super interesting, interesting background, um, which will reflect in today's presentation. Um, he used to be the head of uh, British Army's head of bomb disposal and search. 
uh, and uh, very interestingly, I am curious to find out uh, he uh, later transitioned uh, to other roles to McKinsey as a consultant and a product owner and um, eventually became a product leader, the head of product at Moniz. Uh, currently, he is a principal product manager at Amazon. So a super successful journey um, in two very, very different worlds. Uh, but uh, I think Max has learned that there's a bridge between these two worlds. And uh, this evening, uh, he will tell us uh, what uh, these learnings are and how you can apply them as well to your roles. Thank you so much, Max, for joining us. The floor is yours. No worries. Thank you very much. I, I didn't know why this was the first of a new series. Uh, I feel a bit more nervous. Um, <laughs> So, but yeah, let's, uh, let's do it. Um, I just want to, in true COVID, make sure that I'm displaying my slides correctly and, and people can yes. see, they hear me okay? Yes, yeah. all good. Brilliant. So yes, um, thank you very much for the, for the introduction. Um, it was fantastic. Yeah, so uh, I, I sort of was head of, I suppose, at search at sort of one of the NATO courses um, as one of my final roles in the military. Um, I left, I spent about a decade in the military. I left and then I, I built a couple of products in the military, although I didn't know that was what I was doing at the time. And I left um, to sort of pursue technology and product. Um, I spent some time at McKinsey, some time at FinTech and, and now now working in Amazon Prime Video. And my military experience was, was hugely formative in, in my adult life. And some of the lessons I learned, um, I've, I've carried with me, I've, I've sort of pulled with me. And I feel they've really helped me be a better product person and a better product leader. So sort of these are the sort of the high line of this sort of the three of the key lessons. The army gives you a lot of responsibility very young. So I was 21, 22, I got given um, 35 uh, soldiers, men and women, and uh, no real life experience, just training and, uh, and got told to sort of get on with it. Um, and uh, you learn very quickly and you learn some lessons the hard way. And um, what I want to talk about tonight is, is leadership and these three lessons of which leadership is a, a common theme throughout the three of them. Um, and what unifies these lessons is, is, is leadership as well. So what I want to do to start with is sort of talk a little bit about leadership. The, pro the problem with leadership is it's so contested. There's so many different definitions and it means so many things to different people. Um, I've been trying to think about leadership for 20 years and, and to be honest, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm no closer to, to a single answer uh, now than, than when I started. Um, but I have you know, learning about leadership and thinking about leadership and writing about leadership, I found very, very, very helpful. So what I want to do here is give a 2,500 year brief overview of leadership in, in sort of five minutes, which is quite ambitious, and then use these sort of this leadership as a lens through which to explore the sort of the three lessons that are learned. So the early theories of leadership are very much person-based definitions. Um, it was who you are that mattered. Sun Tzu said the leadership was about intelligence, credibility, humanness, courage, and discipline. Plato, you can see on the left, the left photo in his book, The Republic, he said that leadership was best exercised by, exercised by philosopher kings who possessed a love of wisdom, intelligence, reliability, and a willingness to lead a simple life, which is you know, quite a different approach to what you see sort of some people in today's climate. These are really sort of traits or characteristic based definitions of leadership. And if you see the two other photos, you know, I'm British, you know, Elizabeth I and Winston Churchill. As a British person, you have, discussing leadership, you have to have a photo of Winston Churchill. But these sort of personify, at least for the British people, sort of what leadership is. Elizabeth I, incredibly intelligent, very decisive, very strong in her beliefs, um, fiercely intelligent, um, but took, had intellectual flexibility and took the time to get a number of different points of view. So a lot of traits, a lot of traits there. Um, Winston Churchill, again, hugely eloquent, both as an you know, orator, but, but in writing as well, incredibly hard work ethic. And a lot of people have said, these are the reasons that, that he was successful. Quite a controversial figure as well, you know, it, you know um, as you know, a lot of historians and academics have all pointed out, you know, the, are the darker sides of leadership recently. These person-based definitions of leadership sort of had a boost after World War II. Sort of researchers looked at successful leaders in World War II and said, what, what do these people have in common? And what can we learn from them? 
and they extracted lots of traits and said, this is what's important, let's select leaders or train these specific traits. The problem is, you know, great, this great man theory, as it's, as it's been called, is one of the weaknesses. The reason why it's called great man theory shows one of its weaknesses. Um, and, and this sort of person-based leadership definition is sort of being discredited now quite widely in theory and practice because of, it has quite a lot of weaknesses. The lists of tra traits kept on growing and growing as people added to them. Nobody could agree what was most important. Um, they failed to address the role of context. The traits in one context is not helpful in another context. Being tenacious and dogged might be helpful in one context, but in a more political context could be, could be the opposite, could be counterproductive. Um, it, they often ignore the dark side of leadership, such as narcissism, selfishness and narcissism. And, and the analysis that was done in World War II said to be a great leader, you needed to be male, over six foot, you know, white, as well as had these traits. And they mistook correlation for causation. They only researched men fighting on the battlefield, not the amazing work that Commonwealth soldiers had done, not the amazing work that women had done fighting in the partisans in, in mainland in occupied Europe or fighting in the special operations executive or, or elsewhere. And there was a huge you know, sexism and selection bias. And so, and that's why person training, person based leadership definitions are helpful, but are also, um, also not helpful. And then we come on to leadership as, as a role or a title. You know, leadership is about the title you have or the role you have. Hierarchies are everywhere, we're all in them, no matter how flat they are, there are hierarchies. And you know, these definitions suggest it's your role or title. You have a role or title, you make decisions, and then, but then this suggests that you have decision making and you are a leader by your definition, by your role or title, and you lead and direct from the top. Again, this has weaknesses. It doesn't account for the leaders that emerge. People like Martin Luther King or Mahatma Gandhi, who, who were not in any formal positions of leadership, but ended up with a number of large, large number of followers and impacting great change you know, on their organizations in the world. And also, if you're in a position of leadership, that doesn't necessarily mean you're good at it or you're a good leader. Yeah, you can be the CEO, but, but still people don't have to follow you just because you're the CEO. They're more likely to, but they don't have to. Doesn't mean you're right and doesn't mean you're making good decisions. So there, there are weaknesses around this. Um, and then if there's problems with position and role and as a person, perhaps it's about what you do. Does that make you a leader? So there are a lot of frustrations about other definitions of leaders. So people thought about, okay, is it about what you do in the processes you have. In the 1960s, the second industrial revolution led to a huge rise in the complexity of modern business in terms of international and in size. And so people like McGregor looked and said, perhaps it's the leader's behavior that really matters. He sort of suggested if you had uh, lazy people, you needed to, in his words, dominate them. That was his sort of Model X approach. I, I, I definitely don't advise that. If, if they were Model Y, they just needed encouragement. Maslow identified his hierarchy of needs in the 1960s and said it was a leader's job to understand that and motivate people through understanding what their motivation was. Others saw the role of context as being really important, balancing team and task, complexity of task, type of problem, or the relationship between the leader and the follower, or the skill and maturity. Tanamam and um, her, sorry, Hersin Blanchard said it's about the maturity and a skill of the follower. If they're really skilled and very mature, then it's about coaching and nudging. If they're not, it's about being much more directive. These definitions were super helpful as they helped people think beyond, it's about me and it's about my position or it's about me as a person, it's about the wider context and, and being able to need to adapt rather than having a one size fits all approach. But again, there are weaknesses in this approach. There was no agreement on what mattered the most. Was it the problem? Was it the follower? Was it the leader? Uh, so you had the same problem as, as, as other, other definitions of leadership. And these definitions also had a sort of static and idealized view of the relationship between a leader and follower, right? The perfect leader and the perfect follower. You know, humans aren't like that, you know, um, and there's a dynamic and complex relationship between, between human beings. And all, you know, leaders and followers are irrational. And sometimes uh, somebody will work hard for a leader, not because of the process, but because of who they are and their relationship with that person. So there's weaknesses again. And sort of finally, the sort of fourth main bucket that leadership 
theories and styles fit into is, is leadership is about the impact you have. And it's about the change you bring for good or for bad. And, and that's what makes you a leader and by success or successful. Uh, um, Keith Grint, one of my professors at Warren Business School, he said, results are the purpose of leadership. But he also said that successful leaders are successful, which is interesting because that means that all that suggests that you can only view that in hindsight. But this idea of persistent achievement is very helpful and is compelling. Um, however, some, uh, quite a lot of people have challenged whether leaders are actually contribute to success. Tolstoy said leaders are like the waves in front of the bow of a ship. They are formed by the ship. The ship doesn't form the wave. And so that, yeah, that's a really interesting approach on like how much do leaders really matter? Um, a number of people have tried to sort of address that. Danny Kahneman said that CEO and company performance is about a 30% correlation, which is you know, a lot smaller than people would think, but still significant. These exact numbers are probably not accurate, but the research does suggest that, that leadership does matter and does have an impact. The weaknesses of these definitions is that it can't explain why a leader is successful, it just explains that they are. So there's obviously a, a huge limit there. And, and also, if, if leadership's about having a success, it's about the outcome, not about the journey that leads to a utilitarian view where the end justifies the means. And that's a very dark road to go about in terms of, oh yeah, I can do bad things if the cause is just, which is obviously you know, yeah, very difficult. And, it's, and then again, it's really hard to disentangle with all the factors and speed of the modern world, what, how a leader contributed to success. So, Hopefully that was you know, about five minutes of two and a half thousand years of, of leadership theory. And what I hope to show is there is no answer. Leadership is incredibly complex and it's multifaceted. So look at leadership as multifaceted. And I'm going to try and apply these lenses to the three leadership lessons that I sort of, that, that, that I had. So I'll spend a bit of time on these. So the picture you can see, these are two ceramic plates you wear in your, in your body armor in the British Army. They weigh about six kilos. They're made of you know, super secret ceramic. They'll take three armor piercing rounds uh, before they fail at point blank range. I want you to think about this idea of body armor and I'll come back to it a little later. I was stationed in the British Army in Germany for four years in a British, as a British Army soldier based in Germany in a British Army base. I loved being posted in Germany. The people were lovely. The, the country's beautiful. And one of the great things about being a British Army station, British Army person being stationed generally is, is people don't disappear off the weekends. They generally stay together. They don't sort of leave camp and go and see their friends and families. They do, but, but not every weekend. And this builds a really strong community and esprit de corps in, in, in your organization. One of the rituals every Friday is, is battle PT. So you put your body armor on, you sign your weapon out the armory, you put a big Bergen on with some weights in it and you go and run around an obstacle course or carry stretches or you do loads of things get very sweaty and muddy for a couple of hours but then after that everybody goes to the squadron bar squadron's about 130 people you go to the squadron bar they don't exist anymore for obvious reasons but you go to the squadron bar and you sort of rehydrate using German beer this was quite a while ago I had to point out things have probably changed um, and one of the rules of the squadron bar is there's no rank so as an officer or as, or as a non-commissioned officer, you, turn, you, have, you wear your rank either on your chest or on your shoulders. You turn your rank over and it's a symbolic that yeah, there's no rank in the squadron bar. So adrenaline's going, the endorphins, post-PT endorphins are flying and you're sort of slightly dehydrating and hydrating with beer. And after a couple of, um, I would say hours, it's probably not that long actually, people, the discussion and debate generally turns to how things are going and, and what people have done. And you know, I was, a, I was an officer in a really senior position uh, and people would have sort of no uncertain terms come up and prod you in the chest and say, look, you messed up or one more thing. And so we would joke, we would put our, before we went to the squadron bar, we would, you know, hand our normal body armor in, but we would put our drinking body, our beer body armor on because we knew we were going to get these sort of sharp prods in the chest from people who are unhappy. And what I learned from that is it was incredibly helpful but humbling experience but it was it was very helpful and if you look at a position i didn't have a position authority in the bar you know people still knew i i had a you know, had a rank and, and but it was formally discouraged 
So it sort of removed my position authority. If things had gone well, you know, if you look at it from a results-based view, if things had gone well, I'd get a lot less finger poking than if things had gone badly. And as a person, as the, in the traits, what I, what I learned is it, it keeps getting this feedback. Some of it is relevant, some of it is not. Uh, but it keeps you grounded and it, and, it, and it keeps you humble. And as a process, it's a pro it was a process by which people could give me feedback, or, or everybody else, it, was, or it wasn't just me, um, could give you, it's a pressure release, and people could give you sort of unfiltered feedback. And what I took what I've taken away from that, you know, it's, it can be quite brutal at times, but you mentally preparing with this beer body armor. What I took from that is I need to keep that going. I need this mechanism and process. I need to think about how do I take my position, my positional authority out of the equation? How as a person do I allow people, uh, do I be humble? Do I allow people to come up and give me this hard feedback? How do I go out and search for it? So that's what I try and do now. I try and really hurt, find that feedback which hurts because if it's easy people are not being honest you nobody is right all the time um and probably not right most of the time so you know i now very seriously try and try and find that brutal feedback the second sort of story i have is 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 no one's going to no one's going to die in product i put a star because the the title is deliberately hyperbolic um and of course, there are some people who work in pharmacology or, or medical devices where a, a, you know, one mistake could lead, you know, could, could lead to somebody dying. But in the large gamut of all the decisions that most of us make, we should definitely improve our customers' lives, but, but the you know, lives are not going to hang in the balance. And in one of my tours in Afghanistan, I was working with the Royal Engineers for, for a number of months, and I was working with a, you know, a, a Royal yeah, a, a, a Royal Marine Commando, which is about 600 at the time, 600 plus people. And one of my roles was a battle captain. So every, I'd have a 12 hour stint every few days where I would you know, go into an ops room. You're sort of thinking of an ops room in the American sense with big screens everywhere and people wearing clean press uniforms and microphones and real time video and electronic maps. This was a British version. So it was like a tent, one screen and, and a sort of map with pens on it, with pen marking on it. So it's sort of a lot more basic effect. And, and what you would do is you would, you would manage the battle and try and provide help to all these 600 you know, Royal Marines on the ground, everything from logistics, air, air support, uh, casualty evacuation. And, and one of the things that I remember most was managing a aerial assault into one of the most dangerous parts in Southern Afghanistan, where we had you know, tens of helicopters sort of going in and landing and things happening and casualties and, and enemy contacts. And they trained me very well for that. I was incredibly lucky. It was an amazing experience, but I had a lot of training. But what it did was it made me really think about perspective. And the lesson I've carried through with me is one, the level of training, the process of training and having a process to follow when things go wrong. And also of being of perspective, of thinking through how serious something is and respond that then allows me to respond in the right way. So, and as we look more upon our lives now with COVID, the economic, macroeconomic conditions, we're going to have more and more emergencies and more urgent, serious decisions that need to be made. And thinking through from a personal perspective, being calm, being approachable, allowing people to surface problems means you can solve them earlier. But also thinking through perspective, I found very helpful. So, you know, Chip, Chip and Dan Heath wrote a book decisive, super helpful. What would it be like 10 minutes, 10 days, 10 months, 10 years from now? And that's really helpful because it helps you give perspective and allows you to then think, okay, I, I, okay, this is important, but not that important. Okay, I can now address this as I want to address this. And that's been incredibly helpful because I've managed emergencies and companies I've been at and that perspective and that pause has been incredibly helpful. Finally, I think one of the hardest lessons I've learned is sort of what does servant leadership mean? Um, serve to lead is the motto of the British Army Officer Corps. When you go to Sanders for a year, they teach you how to be an officer for a year. Um, serve to lead is everywhere. You have a metal cap badge, you put it on every day on your berry, every time you're sort of marching up and down the square, you sort of look at yourself in the mirror so you don't get any penalties. Uh, it's in the book, so they give you a book, Serve to Lead, which is the uh, British Army's Manual of Leadership, which I still have. And so this sort of this thrust of service is, is one of the strongest things that have kept me through the military, but also 
outside. But I really didn't understand. It took me a long time to really understand what it meant. Um, when you when you in San Jose and go on a on a training exercise, you you as a cadet, one of you is put in charge to be the officer, and you have to let everybody. You have to make sure everybody's eaten before you can eat. You make sure everybody's clean their weapon. You make sure everybody's okay, and that's drilled into you again and then again. Um, but when I let Sandhurst and sort of got into the real world, it sort of took it too far. I would sort of always sort of metaphorically throw myself on the grenade. And this sort of caused problems with me and my leadership because I would get really annoyed with my soldiers get messed around or, or, or things like that. And, or, or I would sort of try and solve too many things myself. And it got to one point in the, in the same example that I gave earlier, where I was battle captain in Afghanistan. It was my first tour, uh, the first serious operational tour. Um, you know, I nearly burnt out. I was doing sort of 16, 18 hour days for three months. I didn't see the sun for three months because I was getting intelligence, you know, and sorting lots of things out. And luckily I didn't make a bad decision that led to anything serious, but that wasn't due to me. That was due to luck. And also I created this tension between myself and, and sort of my leadership because I was being too protective or I saw my role as protecting my soldiers too much. And it took me a long time to realize what, what serve to lead really meant. And I've taken that with me. It, you know, one of the things I do is look after myself. So you've got IQ, you've got EQ, you know, I have a sort of physical quotient, which is, you know, am I making good decisions? Am I tiring myself out? Am I eating properly? Am, am I mentally and physically in a good place to make decisions? But also secondly, am I fighting the right battles? Am I serving the people I lead to the right man, to the right? So those are, those are sort of very quickly, the three, le three lessons that I've carried through with me and I've found incredibly helpful. When sort of I ask you to reflect, leadership is incredibly complex and multifaceted. Reflect on it, talk about it and write about it. The, those are the best ways to think about it. Writing about it forces you to take yourself out of the equation and justify things rather than use the power of your personality to convince people. Uh, find truth tellers. They're, you know, people who speak truth to power are incredibly rare. Um, find them, nurture them. They're probably not going to be somebody you have direct authority over. You'd be very lucky if you find them, but so go and find some other people. Build up your physical quotient. Look after yourself. Think about your physical quotient. Think about what triggers you. The Chimp Paradox is a great book. Triggers by Marshall Goldsmith is a great book. Uh, a great a book. Um, How to Have a Good Day by Caroline Webb. X McKinsey is also a very good book about sort of managing your physicality of, of being a leader as well. So that's it. I think those are those are my three lessons. A whistle stop tour. I've really enjoyed it and really looking forward to some questions. Thank you so much, Max. Uh, everybody, if uh, you have question, any questions at this time, please uh, let us know. Um, I think we already had one question, Max, um, from Simon Chapman, who was also uh, serving, um, and. <laughs> His question was, would you consider that being in a great regiment, surrounded by great people and commanded extremely effectively by an incredible CEO, helped you on your path to where you are today? So if it's the same time and channel, we were served together while in Germany, which is great. Oh. We love to keep it in touch. Um, one of the most impressive non-commissioned officers I've very I met and he then got promoted. Um, we work very close together. Yeah, it's about, the, the army is great. The army's spent four or 500 years taking people off the streets, sometimes some of the sort of dregs of society and, and putting them in a position to do amazing things. And that's, and that's from everything. That's the position you get given. That's the process of training. That's the esprit de corps that you get. Um, and, and tradition, obviously, and, and ritual pay, plays a huge part in that as well. I think uh, I was I was very lucky uh, with my CEO. Um, he was he was very understanding and patient with me, um, and yeah, it, it, it takes a lot. It takes um, it, you know it takes a, 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 a village to raise a family, and it takes an organisation to make great leaders. And and part of that, I, I do think this sort of brutal feedback. The army is great at brutal feedback. The Royal Marines are, are, are especially so, and um, yeah, they're not afraid to tell you you're you're not doing well. Um, um, so that so that you can you learn and grow and 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 their expectations are you learn and grow. If you're 22 years old leading 40 soldiers in operations, you're gonna make mistakes. You, you don't have you don't have the life experience the CEO has, a, uh, yeah, the commanding officer who's had like 16, 17 years in the army. 
Cool. Um, Cristiano Del Moral just wants to say that uh, Max is an incredible leader. Uh, he had the huge opportunity to learn a lot from you. So, so uh, again, Cristiano, I was from the last company I worked at, and you know, I hired him virtually from Brazil to come over to Europe. Um, and one of the, one of the things I asked for is sort of, do they sort of read read about books and leadership and, and leaders, and are they self reflective and try to be humble? And and Cristiano came across very strongly, like strongly enough that I sort of moved him, moved him from Brazil. And it was a pleasure to work with. I hope, hopefully we'll get some questions. This is quite nice, but, but, but I'm sure people have got to. We have a couple of other questions. Uh, what are the main differences between being a product manager in a consulting company versus being a product manager in a normal organization, regular organization? That's really interesting. Um, so, and it depends, and again, I'm going to give the academic answer, it depends. So Wayne McKinsey, I sort of built this internal product called McKickstarter, it was like an innovation platform, and I owned and built that. So in very, it was an internal product, and it was very similar to, you know, to building a product, you know, other products I built elsewhere. Uh, working with clients is quite different, uh, but then again, that depends on the client. You know, some clients you would go in and they wouldn't know how to do product at all, so you would effectively be the product person, and it would be very consultant heavy. And then over time, you would sort of you know, move, move consultants out and move, move, the, move the clients, people in. So they learned over time. Other times you were just doing a diagnosis or, um, or you're trying to see and help them. And so you're acting a lot more as an advisor. Um, the main difference between consultancy and, and, and building is you generally, generally give advice as a consultant. And so sometimes that's taken sometimes that's not sometimes that's taken and executed badly sometimes that's taken and executed well and still doesn't work that's life um whereas as a product manager or a product person in an organization you own it you know you really do own it and you own the its success uh, or failure um and and you do a lot more of the execution um, I cool. think um, Patrick Alberts has a question as well. Patrick, do you want to ask it live? I've uh, allowed you to speak if you want to share the question. Hi, Patrick. I think you're on mute. Uh, I think he's asked it in the chat, so I'll read it out. How does top down management versus team empowerment compare? From our, this is a great question, and I've thought about this in a number of different ways. So the military has got this idea of mission command, which is we tell you what problem to solve, and then you go away and work out how to solve it. Yeah, that, that's that's how they say it should work. In reality, is a lot more messy. Um, but but life in reality is always more messy. I think it depends what type of the military you work in. Some of the places I've worked in, it, it's very uh, it, it's more emergent um, uh, than others. Um, but when I compare to some of the sort of startups or scale outs I worked in, it's, it's, or even consulting, it's very different. You know, you're responsible to um, build, you know, ask for forgiveness rather than permission, go away and get something done. You know, in most parts of the military, you, know, you can't get away with that. Um, so um, that's quite interesting. I think top down is, it's a bit too much of a blunt instrument to describe leadership again. Because, you know, there, there are a lot of instances where you can lead from the front in the military, you know, in a firefight, you are the man at the moment and, and leading, leading what's happening. And, you know, you might have you know, a colonel or a major or even a general. Um, and most of the time, they're unlikely to tell you how to win a firefight. Um, and that's actually quite different from being in a startup because, you know, well, the one thing you're not ever short of in a, in a startup or scale up is input from everybody and so right. so it's quite different so yeah i think i think you can look at it in a number of different ways does that answer your question or else more? yep um another question any concrete ideas of how to get this brutal constructive feedback when an organization culture doesn't usually do it and you only hear the positive uh, feedback sure I, I think this is really interesting the royal marines are great when they write a report on you it's warts and all and you, and you sort of i've left that you never see 
what people really think. You know, I, I, you know, in a number of the orgs that I've been a part of, I really try to give people a performance review, which encompasses everything, um, but try and delink that from you know, promotion and salary. I think I think they're very different conversations. I think that helps separating feedback and performance from salary and promotion. Separating that is really helpful because you can have a really honest conversation about okay, here's some areas you need to work on, but you know, and then you can have a conversation saying, look, you're still going to get promoted, you're still going to get paid. That I found is is super helpful um, if you're doing that to your direct reports. Um, really spending time getting to know them so that you can come across, or at least not just come across, but be accepted. So when people vent, you allow them that pressure release. When people attack you personally, this is going to happen. If you're in a leadership position where things are tight, People are going to have a go. At you. you put your you put your body on it, you know. And if you don't, you respond in the moment. You if you don't have this mental beer body armor or body armor, you you're taking it personally, and you're not seeing the pain or the upset that that person's going through and why they're giving you that feedback. So this mental body armor is the le is one of the main lessons I've taken away. Is you know I try to elicit it, and when I get it, it hits the body armor and it doesn't hit me. Um, and, and I really try and empathize and understand with, with what it is. Sometimes, you know, it doesn't mean I listen to all feedback. Well, it means I listen to it, but it doesn't mean I take it. You've got to triangulate. You don't want to overcompensate. Um, but you know, that the, the body armor stops you responding in the moment and don't respond in the moment. Don't counter argue. Don't go back and say, well, you're crap as well. That's not helpful. Um, <laughs> So this mental body armor, delinking performance and potential and promotion, I think is super helpful. Um, and really asking for it and pushing for it and saying, look, I, this is, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you, tell me what's wrong, tell me how I could be better. And if you do that enough, people get used to it. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, good. So uh, right now we don't have any more questions. If anybody wants to ask, uh, please write it. The, write them in the chat. We, we can take them. Um, I think uh, could be useful if um, you can share a bit about the PVP learnings you had. I think Kamini, Kamini, if you're still with us. Yes. Um, yeah, so, Ma so Max, I had a, a few questions about your participation in the Product Management Executive Program. Um, how was your experience overall? I found it, I found it really interesting. Um, I, really try, I really try to invest in, in, in education and, and training for myself. You know, it can sort of come across as quite selfish to take a whole week out, but, but I, think, I think the dividends for the organization and for yourself and, and also for those who need it definitely worth it. Um, you know, I, I really, really enjoyed it. I loved it. I think Noah is, is an amazing person and an incredibly gifted uh, teacher. And I think the quality of the lecturers that you had was amazing. Yeah. Um, it, well, it gave me the time and space to think about what I was going through, what things were going well at a sort of, not just an, you know, not just an individual level, but at a sort of company level. What things mm -hmm. were going well, what were going badly, um, and that other people are in the same boat. Uh, you know, there's no new problem under the sun. You sort of, you know, a couple of us bared our soul in in one of the discussions, and everybody was sort of experiencing the same thing that you normally experience um, working in product. You know, too much direction, too little direction. People with long, what we call in the military, long screwdrivers that, you know, that are far away and trying to sort of tinker, tinker with your tank from a long way away. Um, and uh, that was a really nice feeling to sort of feel that other people, you know, were going through the same problem and also, you know, keeping in touch with them and having other people not within your world to bounce ideas and stuff. Yeah. Like a couple of the stuff that I've faced challenges, I talked through with some of my peers after the course. Um, and that was very helpful as well. Yeah. So what changes did you make after the program in your life? Um, yeah. Apart from joining a different company. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things I realized for you, um, one of the things I realized is is sort of my relationship with people and working on that. And that was sort of an era of reflection that I went away and, and sort of looked at. Um, strategy was a really interesting thing I wrestled with, sort of, you know, thinking through 
the difference between company strategy and product strategy? Is there a difference? How do they link? Who should own them? How do I own product strategy, but then give enough freedom for those that I lead to come up with own their strategy? I spend a lot of time uh, thinking through that, especially in you know, when I was working in finance at the time. Finance is incredibly uh, unforgiving of mistakes. So how do you sort of encourage innovation, quick thinking, and you know, decision making at the lowest possible level? while still you know, being compliant, while still you know, doing all the things that, that you need to do. So yeah, it, it, it was really, it was really helpful. It's it quite an inflection point in my career. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insights. I think, I think there's a good, another question. Yep, we have another question from Louis. I uh, often have to deal with lots of ambiguity. What are the tools, techniques, uh, do you use to lead teams to ambiguity, for example? The other, yeah, this is a great. Luis, <laughs> you want to to speak to us? Uh, I have unmuted you, so feel free. Hi, Luis. I think Luis is still muted. I see a little red icon next to him. He, he needs to unmute himself, I think. Luis, yes, yes. Uh, hey, Max, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Oh, awesome. Okay, yeah. So, um, yeah, just to set the scene, of course, lots of product teams, especially in the early stages of product, have to deal with tons of ambiguity. So I'm just really interested to, to learn from you, really, and share your experiences on how you keep teams focused on what matters. Um, of course, you have a mix of different people that you're leading and working with. Some folks tend to latch on ambiguity more than certainty. So how do you keep the team in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. When, when, um, um, could you go on mute? You know, some feedback, Lewis. Brilliant. So one of the things you always think about is there's a great there's a great graph. I'm not sure if I'm showing it that well, but one is time, time. The other one's impact and decision making ability and knowledge. Over time, you will get more knowledge. Knowledge goes up, but over time, your ability, your decisions, impact will go down. So you're know, thinking. Yeah, if you think that through as a mental model to start with, you have to sort of decide, you know, the impact of your decision is, is ever decreasing as the world continues, technology moves, competitors move, and your knowledge gets better. So knowing that this is normal is a good first step, but, but also knowing you have to have some level of ambiguity, what level of ambiguity are you comfortable with is also very helpful. And in, in product discovery, I sort of break it down into sort of there's three steps. There's product solution fit. Does this product theoretically solve this problem? Yes or no? Then there's product market fit. Will people use it, like friends and family? Will people use it for free? Like, you know, do people in the real world use this to solve the problem? Then there's business model fit. Can I make money from it? And, and normally there's a, those three stages. Um, and you only ever get to stage two and stage three with, with customers. And so, Spending time up front, does this problem, you know, does the problem exist? You know, what is the size of the problem? Is it a hundred million, hundred billion pound problem? And then how I got a, you know, what, what else solved this problem? You know, porters, five porters, are there any substitutions or competitors that solve it? Or, or is this a blue ocean? And then, okay, I have a, does my solution theoretically solve that? Once you're there, that leaves you in a really good place to go, okay, we've got a hundred billion pound problem. This sol you know, this sol these five things solve it, but these are the weaknesses of these four. This is why my solution is better. And then you have to get to product market fit, which is the only way you get there. And the only way you solve it is through people using it. And that could be friends and family, a beta launching it. But the more time you spend in, you know, once you've got to problem solution fit, you are never going to get to product market fit without customers, without people using it. And people often go, okay, I've got, they spend too long in, in that sort of area. You know, the customer never lies. The, one of the, the greatest stories I heard was when Sony were inventing the boom box, which doesn't really exist anymore, but, but in the 1980s, you had these big stereos full of massive D-cell batteries. Um, and the first one they invented, they, had a, they, had a, they invited loads of people in to see what color it should be. And uh, they asked loads of people and everybody said, yeah, I want a white one, I want a blue one, I want a black one, I want a multicolored one. And then they had like five piles of these ghetto glasses in different colors on the way out and told people to pick one up on the way out. 
all the black ones went and then people came back and complained that there were no more black ones and so although everybody had been saying for like two hours that they wanted a red one they really didn't because customers had actually voted with something that was precious to them which was you know okay i want to get a gloucester i i want it to be that and so yeah once you know once you think your solution technically solve theoretically solve the problem get customers in or launch or be the launch because that's the the quickest way you'll find out if you're working with. and how can you do that in a lower cost cheap way that's you know that's compliant and everything else is, is is that what you're after lewis or is it more about how do you guide i think there was an element of guiding others to do it. no that, that that was awesome Matt. that was terrific insights there and and i was just kind of really interested to learn about um, making sure teams are focused, you know, for example, being hypothesis driven uh, during the development process. And as you say, getting things in front of the, the customer. Uh, in some cases, it's more difficult to interact with customers. Um, but those are great insights. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And yeah, so that yeah, B2C is always easier than B2B because in B2C, your customer and user and is all the same person. In B2B, B2B is more difficult. Your user, your customer and your client can be three different people. So yeah, it's, it's, it's obviously more difficult and you have a more, you have more of an audience. So you need to tailor that as well. Right. Cool, thank you so much. Um, is it okay, Max, if uh, people reach out to you in case they have other questions or? Sure, so, so reach out to me if you've got, if you want to discuss leadership, I love doing it. I love, this, I love talking about it and thinking about it. Um, you know, ideas are sharpened on the whetstone of other people. So, um, using military term. So, yes. Or if you want to talk about or ask about the INSEAD, in the Product Management Festival, I've been to. I've loved it. Um, I think it was it's fantastic. I really enjoyed it. So, if you want to ask about that, or if you want to ask about the INSEAD uh, Product Executive Course, more than happy to answer any questions about that. I did it. Um, I found it incredibly valuable. Um, not just personally, but yeah, for my organisation. So yeah, more than happy. Please reach out. I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, but there's generally one way. Uh, I do have a blog, gettingbetterevyday.org, where I try to sort of post some sort of uh, thoughts. That's where I try to sort of do my noodling because then I can access it no matter where I work or, or where I am. So yeah, please. And also if you've got feedback, um, let me know what part of this you liked and didn't like so I can go back and refine it and make it better. Thank you so much, Max. That was incredibly insightful. And uh, thank you for sharing some very personal stories at the end, which, um, yeah, I think uh, then kind of changes the whole perspective because you're speaking from your personal painful experience. So um, vulnerability always helps. Um, good. So then that's it. That's a wrap. Thank you, everybody, for joining, for being with us for the last hour. Thank you, Kamini, for being here as well. Uh, we're going to do these sessions again. Stay uh, posted about uh, our announcements. And uh, I hope this was useful and you got a lot of learnings. And you can go back to your teams and uh, apply them. Have a nice evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for all Thanks, <laughs>